to be aware of. That's what he was talking about. Yeah? Raise your right hand. You can adjust the microphone if you need to and just make sure you speak loud enough. Go ahead and say thank you, Your Honor. And Marlene, can you please uh, state your name and spell it for the court reporter? My name is Hyacinth Smith. Can you spell it, please? Hyacinth Smith. Can you spell Hyacinth? H Y A C I N G H. And it's Smith is the normal spelling? Yes, M S M I T H. I'm sorry, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. You were spelling it. I apologize. Do you also sometimes go by the name Marine? Yes. Is that what you prefer to be called, Marine? Yes, I do. Now, Marine, uh, who is Andrine McDonald to you? She's my daughter. And uh, who is Andre McDonald to you? My son-in-law. And who's Elena McDonald? My granddaughter. Now, Marine, back in 2019, where did you live? Solitude Cove, 1042, Solitude Cove, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, you had mentioned, I would asked you about some of the, the members of your family. Who lived at 1042 Solitude, though? Andrea McDonald, Andre McDonald, Hyacinth Smith, Elena McDonald. So the four of you lived there? Yes. Uh, uh, what year did you move into Solitude, though? 2017. And when you moved in in 2017, was it that same group and all four of you living there? Yes. Do you have a room at Solitude, though? Yes. And you're on closet? You're on closet? Yes. Uh, so that was, that was your residence at Solitude, though? Yes. And you had lived there the entire time period that the house had been owned uh, by, by your son-in-law and your daughter? Yes. Who did the claim in the house? I do. Would you clean just uh, all over the house? Yes. Would you clean in the master bathroom downstairs? Yes. Who had the master bathroom? Uh, who, who uh, the master bedroom and the master bathroom? Who did that belong to? Andre and Andre. But you were free to go in there and do any cleaning. Yes. Were you also free to use the restroom there? Could you repeat? Uh, did, did you also use the facilities and things like that in the restroom? Yes. Now, Maureen, I want to call your attention now to March 1st of 2019. That, that's the day that the Andre was missing. Yes. Were you in communication with a Judy Lorenzana, as well as a Carol Gambar, about efforts to try to find where your daughter was, where Andre was? Repeat that for me. Oh, of course. Uh, on March 1st, 2019, the yeah. missing. Yeah. Did you speak to Judy Lawrence on about efforts trying to find where she was? Yes. Did you also speak to Caroline Gamar about that? Yes. At some point, uh, did you try to call your daughter that day, Andre? Yes. Were you able to get a hold of her? No. Did you also try to call your son-in-law, Andre? Yes. Were you able to get a hold of him at first? No. Did you speak to him later in that day? Yes. Now, as part of uh, part of that day, was there a plan for Carol Ann to pick you up and come back to your house at 1042 Solitude Cove? Yes. Did Carol Ann pick you up? Yes, she did. Uh, did she, do you remember if she had anybody with her when she picked you up? Yes. Do you remember the name of that person? Elizabeth. Uh, now, of course, Caroline picks you up. Did anybody else also go with you back to the house? Elizabeth and uh, Judith. Judith? Yes. Uh, did a Tommy also come with you? Yes, Tommy, sorry. Did you all go in, in Caroline's vehicle, in her car? Yes. Now, when you got uh, to your house, at 1042 Solitude, though, did you go inside? 
Yes. When you went inside, did you see Andre McDonald? No, I did not see when I went inside, but I, I called him and then I saw him coming from the garage. Okay, so, so you, you didn't see him initially, but then you saw him come out. Yeah. Did you try to talk to Andre? Uh, yes. What did you ask Andre? I told him that we're looking, we're trying to get in touch with um, Andreen, but we did not hear from her. And he said he's going to check the hospital to see if she's there. Did Andre leave the house? Yes. During the time that Andre was at the house, did he ever tell you or any of the women that you were with to leave the house? No. So did you follow Andre outside as he left? No. But to your knowledge, did Andre leave? Yes. Now, previously, had Carol Ann told you what she saw within the house when she was there earlier? Yes. Did you go and also observe those same things? Yes. Did you look in the master bathroom? Yes. Did you also see that your daughter's vehicle was still in the garage? Yes. Did you go into the backyard and see a burn area? Yes. Now, Maureen, uh, we know that you live at the house at 1042 Solitude Cove. Did you stay there that night between February 28th and March 1st? No. Where were you? I was at work. Why were you at work? Because one of the workers, worker was sick, and Andreen asked me to work that night. So you were at one of the other uh, home health care uh, houses, correct? Yes. Filling in for that sick employee. What did you say? Uh, you were filling in for a sick employee. Yes. Now you had been at the house earlier, though, before you had to fill in, correct? Yes. Ten forty-two solid. Now that burn area that we saw in the backyard, was it there the, the previous day? Previous day, no. So the first time you saw it was March 1st, 2019, when you were there with Carol the other one? Yes. Now, do you recall that the Barricadic Sheriff's Office sent deputies to the house, correct? Yes. Did you speak to those deputies? Did, did you talk to the police? Yes. Did you tell the police that they could search the house at that time? Yes. Did you tell the police that they could search your house at any time in regards to this investigation? Yes. Ms. Smith, I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number 17. Do you recognize the initials were on the signature line? Yes. Whose uh, initials are those? Mine. It, it appears that it's also dated on March the 7th of 2019 with a time of 7.08 p.m. Is that correct? Yes. Is this the consent to search premises at 1042 Solitude Cove? the written consent that you provided to the Bear County Sheriff's Office. Yes. Now, Ms. Smith, prior to that, though, on March 1st, you told them that they could search the house whenever they needed to in regards to this case. Yes. Your Honor, for purposes of record, in the movement of evidence, states it's in the shape of the motion, substituting judgment by the house. No objection. Did Andre speak to the police? Yes. 
Uh, were you present when he spoke to the police, or were you somewhere else in the house? I wasn't present. I was like going into the other room. So you could not hear what they were talking about? No. to take care of the resident that was there, so I couldn't leave. So you weren't sure when you'd be returning back to Solitude Cove, right? What did you say, sir? You, you weren't sure exactly when you would be returning back to Solitude Cove? No. It could have been a number of days. It could have been that night you just didn't know. No. Did you say? Did you clean the house for them? Yes, I do. Uh, did you have a particular schedule when you would do that? Two times per week. Okay. And uh, where did you stay in the house? What did you say? When you were in the house, where did you sleep? In my room. Uh, is that on the second floor? Is that near the master uh, bedroom? Yes, it's up. No, not the master. My room is upstairs. Okay. The master's on the ground floor. Yes, sir. Okay. And do you have a bathroom in your room? Not in my room, but near. Nearby. Near your room. That's the bathroom you normally use when you're you know, going through your morning routine, for example. Yes. Okay. And there are other bathrooms in the house that you would also use, correct? No, I just use my bathroom. You just use your bathroom? Yes. So unless you were actually cleaning the master bedroom bathroom and had to go to the bathroom at that time, you wouldn't have gone in to Andre and Henry's bedroom to go to the bathroom, right? No. No. Um, and you are living with your daughter and your son-in-law. I imagine it's always a little difficult to make sure you give them the privacy they deserve, but you try to give them their privacy, right? Yes, I do. You wouldn't have gone in their bedroom while they were in their bedroom, right? No. Uh, and you wouldn't have just been going through your son-in-law in their bedroom without them there, right? No. Um, that That's sort of a, a special space within the home for them. Yes. Uh, now, you, how long have you been living with them? Two years. Okay. And throughout that time, there were
just have them both because if it's if it's going to keep doing that, then we'll just use the other one for the jury. Okay. It came in at yesterday during lunch. Oh, Have it off. I'm just saying, just have it ready in case the other one doesn't work. They need to flip out. Okay. But apparently, they made some adjustments, so we'll see. Deputy Filiberto Gonzalez, it's uh, F I L I B E R T O. Gonzalez, G O N Z A L E Z. years or 19 years. And what were your general duties and responsibilities back in March of 2019? Uh, patrol officer. And so on specifically March 1st of 2018, were you working that day in your capacity as a deputy in the Derrick County Sheriff's Office? Yes, ma'am. And were you on patrol that day? Yes, ma'am. So did you have an opportunity to be dispatched to the address of one and zero Solitude. Yes, ma'am. What was the nature of the call that you were dispatched for? If I remember correctly, uh, I was dispatched to 1042 Solitude Cove for a uh, missing person report. and just kind of give it a brief glance and let me know if you can say what this is. Uh, this is going to be my uh, my report. Okay. And so uh, you can just use it to refresh your memory if you need to. Thank you, ma'am. From our report, I was uh, dispatched for a welfare check. And then specifically with regard to that welfare check, um, where did you go? 1042 Solitude Code. And when you arrived... I'm going to make the record again reflect on this is reading the report. Okay. Record reflect, and I'm going to continue to do so for another check. Is that a running objection? We're concerned about the record. Do that, we don't know what he 
remembers or what he doesn't remember. Yes, ma'am. and I knocked on the door and uh, I was greeted. Can I, can I stop you to slow down a little bit? So when you get to the residence, where do you book your uh, vehicle? In front of the house. And are you really marked patrol vehicle at this time? Yes, ma'am. And so do you park it on the street? Yes, in front of the house. Okay, so when you said you knocked on the door, which door did you knock on? The front door, ma'am. And uh, who answered? Uh, one of the ladies, I believe it was Carol. Uh, they opened the door. <clears throat> yeah. Let me in. And then you said one of the ladies, were there more than one lady? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember how many? Yeah, if I remember correctly, I want to say it was like three three ladies there. Three ladies at the door? Yeah. What were their names? Um, I'd have to review my report to refresh my memory. So Elizabeth, Miss Isian Smith, and uh, Carol Gunbar. And so when you get to the house, um, what's kind of the first interaction that you have with them? Um, so they opened the door, <clears throat> and I remember that they were all talking at the same time. And uh, I remember instructing them, like, hey, hold on. And I was trying to get the information, but like I said, all three of them were talking. So I was like, hey, hold on, hold on, it's okay. Who are you, who are you? I was trying to determine who each person was. And uh, that was pretty much it. They were all talking at the same time. So once you got them kind of settled down and determined who each of the individuals were, were you able to get from them what their concerns were? Yes. And what was their concern? Um, that they had not heard from Miss Andrean McDonald and that it was out of the norm for Ms. McDonald not to contact them um, and not to go to work and not, not to go to the gym, so they were, they were scared. And then, let me kind of back up. I mean, in your time, I think you said you did with the Bear County Sheriff's Office for how many years again? Uh, at that time, it was like 18, 19 years. Okay. And so is a welfare check a fairly common type of dispatch call for you to make? Or is that something that you would have Yes, ma'am. Was there anything initially different about this particular call, or did it seem fairly routine? No, uh, the, the the three ladies, the way they were 
scared and concerned uh, was different from other other calls like that. And so, um, did you ever go inside the home? Yes, ma'am. And so, who let you in the home? Um, well, all three of them, because they just they were by the door, and then uh, we I stepped in. You know, they allowed me to come inside. And so, when you got in the home, where were you in the home? Uh, right, I guess it's by the front door living area, right there. And did that guess really, did you talk to, to all three of them, or did you talk to one specifically? Uh, well, like I said, I spoke to all three of them, and uh, they were all trying to talk, and and then. Um, if I may, got some report. So, <clears throat> Miss uh, Carol Gunbar and uh, Miss uh, Cancel Elizabeth, they were the ones that uh, were friends with with the uh, Miss Andrea McDonald. Were you able to determine who um, Hyacinth Smith was in relation? Yes, ma'am. I asked them because, uh, like I said, they were all talking, and I said, "Okay, you know what's going? Here? You know, I had to ask them to stop. And who are you? And who are you? And who are you? And, and I was like, "Okay, do y'all live here?" I told the the two ladies, and they were like, "No." And I said, "Well, how did you get in here?" And, uh, and then Miss Smith said that she resided at there at the residence. And did, um, did Carol and Elizabeth explain how they were able to get into the home? Yes, ma'am. They stated that um, they went through the side or on the back uh, to look for Miss Andrea McDonald because they were concerned for her welfare. And I'm guessing that Andrea McDonald was not there. No, ma'am. And so you said that you spoke to Miss McDonald? That was her mother. Were you able to sort of determine um, where she lived at Solitude Cove? Yes, ma'am. And did she live there? Yes, ma'am. So as they're talking to you, um, do, they, do they take you anywhere else in the home, or do you kind of stay right there in the entry? So they were talking to me, and they were stating that they were scared for her well-being they wanted you know they had made attempts to try to find her and um, that's why they were at the location they stated that uh, they had contacted the husband and he was not helpful he was not telling you know telling them anything uh, so then they stated that when they arrived at the location to look for Miss McDonald they came in through the side and uh, they went and they observed a burnt pile of clothes in the back and I said, okay, well, show me, you know. And uh, I remember telling him, let's walk the way you came in. Not because I didn't want to go out the back door. I wanted to, you know what I'm saying, re, uh, recover the same pathway. So we went on through the side, side gate, we went through the side, came around the back, <clears throat> saw the burnt pile of clothing, and I was looking at it, and I was looking around, and, it just, and I was like, okay. So then we went into, inside the house through the back, and I remember we uh, we went into uh, where the restroom was at, the master restroom, and uh, I was looking around, seeing like maybe I saw you know any any type of indication of anything had happened there. Uh, I remember looking at the floor; and it was cleaned up, and I remember looking at the light switch, and uh, it had a blood smear. And I guess are you doing this on your own, or who else is with you actually doing this? The two ladies. Two ladies, well, they were all there. They were all there. So all the ladies that you previously mentioned to the court were with you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so was, uh, was Hyacinth Smith with you? What's that? Was Miss Hyacinth Smith with you when you were here? Yes, ma'am. So I guess at any point, uh, did Andre McDonald arrive on scene? Yes, well, uh, after we looked at the... I, looked at the restroom and saw the, the blood smear and stuff like that. I said, uh, let's go ahead and step out of here. Uh, I didn't want to mess up anything, right? I didn't, I, I didn't know what had happened, so I was like, let's step out. I don't want to mess up anything. Let's wait outside and let me make some phone calls. When we stepped outside, I had them come with me 
and that's when Mr. McDonald arrived at the location. And did you have an interaction with Mr. McDonald? Yes, ma'am. What did he say to you? So, <clears throat> I went up to him, right, and we, so I told him, I go, hey, uh, do you know who these ladies are? And he said, yes. I go, the reason they're here is they're concerned for Ms. McDonald. They're stating that they haven't heard from her and it's out of the norm. And uh, they're trying to locate her, make sure she's okay. And he said, I remember him stating that uh, she was at the hospital up the road. And so whenever you told Mr. McDonald about the ladies here at the home and what they were concerned for, did you explain to him what the ladies showed you inside the house? Uh, no, not not yet, not yet. I, you know, just asking them. Hey, you know why they're here? And did he know why they were there? Yes. And did he ever express to you um, any indication to tell them to leave his property or to not go in his home? No, ma'am. And so I think that. Yes, I had, so I notified my supervisor and uh, to advise them of my observations and the concerns of the uh, three females of the location. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, we have to get uh, authorization to notify an investigator to come out to the scene. And that's when I know I was authorized to contact an investigator. And did you do that? Yes, ma'am. And so then at any point in time, did you um, talk to Mr. McDonald about some of the things that you saw in the house, for example, the, the blood smear or the cleaning of the floor. Did you ever talk to him about those things? Let me look at my report. So what was the question? Well, let me ask a different one, um, Debbie. So when you were talking to Mr. McDonald, he said that his wife was at the hospital. Did you further inquire as to you know where she was or what her status was? Yes. So uh, he said that she was at the hospital, which is like three miles from there, on uh, 281 and Overlook Parkway. And I, my follow-up question to him was like, well, <clears throat> who told you that? And uh, he said that they told him that at the, at the front desk. And I go, who was it? You know, the person's name. He said he didn't know. And then I asked, uh, well, what's wrong with him? He said he didn't know. And I was like, okay. And I go, uh, did you see her? And he's like, no. And I asked, well, I remember stating to him, I was like, well, if my wife was in the hospital, I would have gone to go see her and find out what's wrong with her. And I remember him, he responded that he wanted to come back and let them know that uh, she, where she was at. And so he wasn't able to provide you any information about like, her health or her status? Or no, and he, that. correct, yes ma'am. And so then did either you or somebody from Bear County Sheriff's um, contact the hospital? I believe it was uh, Deputy Schneider was tr trying to verify that information and to see if she was there. And so were you able to determine if indeed Andre McDonald was at that hospital where Andre McDonald said she was? Well, I remember correctly, they, they, uh, Deputy Schneider stated no, she was not there.
Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. What was the last question? Did he give you any other uh, indication as to when the last time he saw Andrew was? Uh, the night before. Yeah. Just for record purposes, you know, you make a bill of my observation sitting here is that in the pause between each question, some last night and pause and period, the deputy is reading his report um, and then answering the question. And I understand the court's ruling, but I need to make sure the record is clear. Um, yes, ma'am. He stated that he had a, had a, had an argument with his wife the night before. And that was the last time he indicated to you that he had seen her. Yes, ma'am. accurately to to the questions. And that's because you have a concern that you may not remember it how you wrote it down, right? No, I remember the 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 uh, that day, sir. I just, you know, trying to and, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to suggest you don't remember it at all, right? But there are a lot of important small details about this, right? Would you agree? Yes sir. The, the specifics of uh, how you came to the house or who you talked to what you did, that, that matters for the law, right? Correct, sir. It's important to get that stuff right. Yes, sir. So you wrote this report, and you've been reading throughout the state's examination. Make sure that you have a clear and crystal recollection written down of what happened, right? Correct, sir. And so things that you don't remember, if you don't remember them without the benefit of the report, you would need to defer to that report. Correct, sir. For the right answer, correct? Correct. So you would trust your report over your memory about this event. Correct. Okay. Fair to say that it's so important that if it's not written down in this report, you can't say for certain that it happened at all, right? Correct. Okay. Now, have you had a chance to read the entirety of that report? No, sir. Okay. Now, uh, you, you testified that when you arrived at the scene to the call that you were greeted at the door by three women, correct? Yes, sir. And those three women were later identified to you as Elizabeth Cancel, Hyacinth Smith, and Carol Gilmore, correct? Yes, sir. Now, all three of them were kind of talking at the same time. Yes, sir. All right. Do you still have the report in front of you? Yes, sir. If you could please uh, take a look at that report and tell me how many times in that report does the name Hyacinth Smith or Smith Hyacinth appear? How many times? Yeah. Uh, I'd have to read it in. That's okay. Now, at this point, I want you to. And are we going to read to you into the reports of evidence and the judge can see that for himself? I agree. I, I don't have an objection to that. Okay, that's fine. So it states it's in an 18 Okay. So, Do you know how many times 
Yes, sir. You, you just note that you arrived and made contact with Elizabeth Cancel, who is the reporting person, and Smith Heisen is the missing person as well, right? Yes, sir. You don't document in there that you uh, inquired about who owned the property, right? That's not in your report. What do you mean, who owned the property or who lived there? You don't say in your report that you made efforts to figure out who owned the property, right? Um, I'd have to read my report, but I remember asking the ladies. I'm just asking you based on what you wrote down. Do, do, you don't document that, do you? Um, I'd have to read it and then answer it. Well, I, I don't, I'm okay with that at this point. Let me, I mean, you, you don't have a recollection about what you wrote down, correct? The exact verbiage? No, sir. And uh, do you trust what you wrote down to be an accurate depiction of what happened that day? Yes, sir. Okay. And when reading it, refresh your recollection as to what you noted that day. Yes, sir. When it was the most fresh in your mind. Yes, sir. Then uh, I would ask that you please refer to your report and tell me if there's any indication there that you asked us that questions about whether she owned the house or she had a right to be there. I'm sorry, what was the question, sir? You never made inquiry, and according to your report, mm -hmm. you do not know that you made any inquiry into who owned the property you had a right to be in the property, right? Well, I, I spoke to the ladies. I, I'm, I'm not asking you what you did, I'm mm -hmm. asking you what you wrote. Okay. okay. Your report doesn't document that you took those steps, did it? No, sir. Okay. It doesn't document that you were invited in by Ms. Smith, does it? Uh, no, sir. It doesn't document that Ms. Smith took you into any particular portion of the house, does it? Well, she let me in, sir. Well, do you not note in the report that you were led into the house by Carol Gambar and Elizabeth Hansel? Mm. I'll call your attention about midway down while I was speaking to Gambar and Hansel. Halfway down where, sir? Did you see the sentence while I was speaking to Gambar, Carol, and Hansel Elizabeth in the residence? Mm hmm You see that part? Yes, sir.
see your copy. Sure, it matches up with mine. Okay. 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 See what it says? They showed me the blood smeared light switch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it says they showed me the, the blood smeared light switch. You're referring to Carol and Elizabeth in that sentence, correct? Yes, sir, correct. You don't mention Hyacinth Smith in that sentence, correct? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Again, you made this report very shortly after the events at issue, right? Yes, sir. Now, when you made the report, did you have you had you already had contact with and communication with a uh, another investigator in the case, Investigator Christopher Lugo? Had I made contact with him? Yes. No, sir. You hadn't spoken to him yet. No, sir. Okay. So your report comes into existence before you speak with Investigator Lugo. Correct. When did you speak with the investigator? I never spoke to him. You never spoke to him. Okay, so your report is, as far as you know, that, that's the only information that you gave to the other investigators in the case, just the report. I don't understand the question, sir. You, you arrived at the scene. Mm -hmm. You took down the information that would get to your report. Mm -hmm. You spoke with Mr. McDonald. You detained him. Mm -hmm. And then you handed the scene off and, and you wrote your report. Is that a fair summary? Yes, sir. Okay. You, didn't, you didn't stick around to assist other investigators in drafting the search warrant affidavit? No, sir. You, you didn't speak with any of those investigators uh, about any of the specifics of what you would later detail in your report? I spoke to Investigator Johnson, I believe, was the investigator. You spoke to Investigator Johnson? And he's the one that came out. Okay. Gotcha. But you never spoke with anyone else? Uh, just Investigator Johnson. If somebody else was going to write a search warrant based upon what you investigated, they would need to refer to your report, right? Correct. The information that you testified to on direct about Ms. Smith inviting you in and telling you that she's uh, a resident of the premises, that's not in your report, right? Yeah, but that's what she told me. I, I that's what you testified to. I was yes, sir. It's not in your report, correct? Correct. honest with you, sir. I'd be, I'd be guessing. I'd be guessing. Did you have a long conversation with him? We, we spoke as to why I was there, who everybody was. Uh, the, the mom, you know, everybody, the all three ladies were all panicking and stuff. You had indicated that you had some discussion about the time that Ann Green was last seen by these people, last spoken to. you recall that testimony a moment ago? Yes, sir. Uh, but you don't note in your report any of that information, correct? I did not note what, sir. But how long she had been missing in the last time that they spoke to her was? Um, I think it's in the report where it says that they had last Let me see. You talked about what you and McDonald talked about, right? Andre, you, you talked about that part. Uh, give me one second, okay? Mm -hmm. She didn't go to work, and they had been trying to contact her. Right, that's what you say in your report. Yes, sir. You don't know the time in your report, do you? No, sir. You don't know how long, approximately, that she hadn't been heard from in the report, do you? No, I didn't put it on there, no. You don't know what she does for a living, do you? No, sir. You don't know when her shift is, or when she's supposed to be at work, do you? Uh, she was supposed to be at work that morning at the court of the gym that morning. But as far as when she's supposed to come in and when she's supposed to clock out, none of that's documented here, is it? No, sir, no. What else have you reviewed in anticipation of your testimony? 
Okay. Like, other than this? Okay. Nothing, sir. Did you review any notes that you had with the DA? No, sir. Did you go over any prior conversations you had? Uh, this morning. Okay. And, and how did that conversation this morning go? He, they just told me that it was going to be a hearing for su suppression and that the trial would start sometime next week. That was it. Okay. But as far as the specifics of what you previously written down or said, they didn't talk to you about it? No, sir. Did you review any of the search warrants that have been issued in this case after you were involved? No, sir. So you don't know what it is that Investigator Johnson or Investigator Lugo have said about what you said? Correct. Yes, sir. And you you tried to follow up on that, but uh, you, you believe it was conflicting. Is that the testimony? Yes, sir. But you're aware that Deputy Schneider inquired as to whether Andrew McDonald is at the hospital, right? Correct, sir. You, Deputy Schneider didn't ask whether Andre McDonald had gone to the hospital to look for her, right? I don't know what he asked, sir. You weren't present for that phone call? No, sir. Okay. Shadow related to you? I don't remember him relaying it to me. I remember he was looking into seeing if uh, Andre had gone to the hospital and if Miss Miss McDonald was there. But as to how the question was put, you can't say one way or the other you weren't there for the call. Correct. But you, you've since come to understand that Andre did go to the hospital, right? Um, you don't yes, know? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I believe he did go to the hospital. When did you learn that? Um, I don't recall, sir, to be honest with you. Would it have been on March 1st? I don't recall, to be honest with you. Would it have been in that time frame? Would it have been in the early March of that year? That well, did you learn that Andre had actually been to the hospital, like you said? I don't recall, sir. I'm being honest. Okay. And, you, and you're unaware of what Investigator Johnson or Investigator Lugo or anyone else that later attended the scene would have learned about that fact. You handed that off to them at that point. Correct, yes, sir. Now, you uh, were asked whether Andre ever told you to leave, right? Remember that question about direct? Whether you, the prosecutor asked you if, if Andrea had ever it directed you to leave his house. Correct, yeah. And, and you indicated no, he never told you that, right? Yes, sir. But to be fair, by the time that Andre saw you, you were inside of his house, right? We were outside. You had already been inside? Yes, sir. Okay. So you were, you were back outside? Yes, sir. Were you going in and out throughout that time that Andre was there, or you were finished by the time Andre got back? Uh, we were standing outside when he, when Mr. Andre drove up. And did you go back after Andre arrived, back inside the building? Mm. No, I'll recall, no, sir. No, no you don't recall either way. Mm -hmm. But uh, other other sheriff's deputies and members of the investigative team did go back inside. Yes, sir. While you were on scene. Yes, sir. And while Andre was present. Yes, sir. And you rather quickly detained. Mr. McDonald in the back of the patrol car, correct? Yes, sir. 
Now, patrol car, does your patrol car have doors? I mean, does it have handles on the interior passenger doors and the rear, rear passenger doors? No, sir. So if you're placed in that part of the car, you can't get out? Correct, sir. And that's where you place it, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So Mr. McDonald was not free to leave? He was de yes, sir. He was detained. Okay. Did you advise Mr. McDonald that he had the right to remain silent? Uh, no, sir. And he said it would be used against him? Uh, no, sir. Did he have the right to an attorney? No, sir. Did you read anything from the Article 3822 warnings, the Miranda warnings that were supposed to be the arrest assessment? No, sir. But at some point in your conversation, Mr. McDonald, told you you wanted a lawyer, right? Yes, sir. And at that point, <clears throat> you any other questions for Mr. McDonald? No. Once you told me he wanted a lawyer, we stopped talking. Yes, sir. And you conveyed that to your brother officers in DCS, Correct, sir. So that no one else would accidentally initiate the conversation? Um, correct, yeah. And just so we're clear, the whole time that this is going on, the three women that you met when you arrived at Solitude Cove are, are yelling at them, right? They were by the front patio area. But they're making accusations. Uh, they're asking where Miss Santrine was at. Implying that he knew. Fair? I would assume so, sir. That's why they were asking. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. And your questions sort of mirror their own sentiments. You're asking him similar things about what he knows about where Andrean is. I asked him if he knew where she might be so we can locate her. They told you didn't. Um, I'd have to read my report. I remember I had put it in there. You, you advised him that she wasn't at the hospital, right? Mm, yeah. What was the question, sir? You, at some point, advised him that you knew that she wasn't at the hospital. I advised him. That, is that correct? Do I have that right? I don't recall advising him. Okay. I want to go back for a second. You were sure. talking about when you first walked into the residence. You uh, indicated that even though your report doesn't document that you determined that Hyacinth was the property owner of the had a right to be there, I guess. Uh, any specific details about Miss Smith's relationship to the property? Uh, that that's what you recall, right? She told me she lived there. Right. Uh, but you told the district attorney's office in the past, in preparation for trial, that that was information that you learned later in the course of your investigation, not when you made it to the front door, right? Uh, she told me that when I walked in, and they were all talking. And I was trying to establish who was who and why they were there. And that's when that lady, Miss Smith, said she lived there. Would it surprise you to learn that in follow-up reports about the discussion that you've been informed, um, for example, Investigator Stubbs, that you only later learned that Hyacinth was the mother of the complainant? That I later learned? Correct. Yeah, that would surprise me. Okay. Now, 
that approach. Yes. show you what I marked is 34, defendant's 34. I call your attention to this highlighted area here. If you could please read that. This right here? Yes. Uh, he said that he was led into the home by Carol and Elizabeth where the blood was in the master bedroom. Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, he said that he was led into the home by Carol and Elizabeth and showed where there was blood in the master bedroom in an area where it appeared someone had recently burned something in the backyard. Okay. And then if you could read this area before this from here to the highlighted area. Deputy Gonzalez relayed to me that when he arrived, there were three women at the scene, Carol Gun uh, Gunbar, Elizabeth Cancel, and Hyacinth Smith. He explained Carol and Elizabeth were close friends of Andreen's and Hyacinth, uh, who we later learned went by her middle name. Maureen was Andreen's mother. Okay. So did, did you, is that indication to you that you were conveying to Detective Stubbs that this is not information that, about Ms. Smith that you learned immediately? I knew that that was her mother when I walked in the door because she told me that. Okay. Do you, do you disagree with any characterization of it? Yeah, that's the lady told me she was a mom. Okay. But again, you didn't, according to the report, I learned that she had a different, I guess, a different name. And did you ever place Mr. McDonald under arrest? No, ma'am. And I advised him that he was not under arrest. He was being detained, and we we're trying to figure out what was going on. And if I go to that last night, that night, uh, was he released? Yes, ma'am. Seen like at midnight. Okay, so you 
got there in the early afternoon, right? Yes, sir. One o'clock or something. Yes, sir, something like that. So you've been in there a long time. Yes, sir. Uh, you gave him one break to have a break, correct? Yeah, I checked on him. I said, hey, do you need to go to the restroom and water? At some point, did you notify his command? You learned he was there first, right? Uh, yes, sir. And did you notify his command that he was detained in the back of the car? Um, no, sir, I didn't notify anybody. Were you aware that someone notified his command? Um, I don't know if anybody notified her. I don't know. Okay. Did you see anyone from the United States Air Force that night? Uh, no, sir. Okay. You were trained when you become a peace officer in search and seizure law, correct? Yes, sir. And you are taught about issues relating to third party consent, right? Yes, sir. And you are taught that private citizens and also violate someone's privacy rights uh, if they do something that you as a police officer, for example, would not be allowed to do, right? Uh, I don't remember. Recall that, sir. They don't teach you that part? I don't recall. Okay. But you are taught about how to obtain consent from someone other than your suspect. Correct. And you were taught if you're going to rely on that, then it's really important that you get it right, correct? Yes, sir. You understand that normally in the United States, if you want to go into someone's house, you need a warrant, right? Yes, sir. And it's only in rare circumstances that you can go into someone's house without a warrant. Right? Correct, yes, sir. And so you understood when you walked into the Solitude Co., you didn't have a warrant, right? I was invited in, sir. Right, you didn't have a warrant. Uh, but I was invited in, that's why I went in there. Uh, real simple question I'm getting. You knew that you didn't have any court order saying you could go in there. Correct. You were relying on Ms. Smith's consent. That's what you're telling this court today, correct? Yeah, correct, yes, sir. And yet you don't write that down in your report. Right? Cor yes, sir, correct. Pass it. Thanks. Thank you, excuse Yes, sir. Uh, do you have
Rich Ray. Right so we have a whole treatment of the issue. So you got it? Yes, sir. This is being loud enough to the microphone. Go ahead, Steve. Rebecca Ferguson, R E B E C C A F E R G U S O N. And so, could you please tell the judge how you are currently employed? Um, I'm currently employed at San C Hospital. And what is your position there? I'm a psychiatric registered nurse. How long have you been in that position? Um, at San C, it's been about eight, nine years. And so, we were a psychiatric ward nurse for San C back in 2019. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, and how long have you been working in that position for Uh It's about eight, nine years now. And are you a, a civilian capacity or a government capacity? I'm a GS employee. So a civilian under government contract? Yes, ma'am. And so just kind of just tell the judge, um, I guess, the uniqueness as to what the psychiatric board is at Nancy Hospital. As far as? Like, what? so for example, different than the ER, right? Like, we all kind of know what the ER does, right? right. But just kind of what more the board is, what sort of patients you treat, um, what your focus is. On gotcha. Um, it's an inpatient psychiatric unit. It's a locked facility um, for military only. Um, we admit patients who are deemed to be a harm to themselves or to anyone else. And you say military only. Active duty, correct. Okay, so would it include like, family members, say? No, ma'am. And how does a patient or a military member come to your ward? How do they get into the ward? Uh, they first start out in our emergency room, and then from there, um, the psychiatrist on call or just psychiatrist in general, if it's during the day, will go down and assess the patient. And then, uh, if they deem them necessary, they'll bring them up to our unit. When he, this is on when he went to get examined at the military, um, as a mentor psychiatric exam, and I guess they're trying to suppress whatever was taken out of his pockets. So I don't even know what was taken out, but uh, is that correct? That's not general reporting. So, um, and then just kind of going back to Yes, ma'am. Are there other ways in the military can get into your ward? Yes, ma'am. They can be directed by their command. It's called a command directed evaluation. And so, um, what is a command directed evaluation? It's when their command structure has concerns, and so they bring them to the emergency room to be evaluated. It's not uncommon, so I mean, we see a mixture of both. And so, what are some of the other ways that members of the military come to your ward other than the command directed evaluation? Um, just like I said, voluntarily, if they are having problems and they come in that way. And once a patient gets to the ER and the patient is either evaluated by the on call, Um, if they, sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. I guess what happens after the evaluation by the psychiatrist, if they decide, if the doctor decides they need to be on board, what happens procedurally to the patient? Um, they'll usually have the patient sign a consent form in the ER um, if they are voluntary or involuntary coming up. And then from there, the emergency room will call our unit, we get report, and then they escort the patients up to our unit. Thank you. 
stolen fax, that um, a patient might have on their, on their person. The patient comes up with their personal effects um, in a garment bag that the ER issues them. And um, once the patient comes in, there's a corridor, we wand them down, um, and then we bring them in, and the personal effects get put behind the nurse's station, which has locked doors and cameras that are viewing the nurse's station. Let me pause you right there. Mm -hmm. So what is the reason, or the, why do you take the personal effects and lock them away? Just because they could have anything, something in there to harm themselves or someone else. Um, we pretty much take away everything at that point. We just have to, safety is number one. And again, so kind of just describe for the, for the judge, what are some of the patients on board there for, potentially? Um, some have suicidal thoughts, some are depressed, some anxiety, some stress, um, other psychiatric illnesses, um, like I said, concerns from command, whether they think that they may be a harm to themselves or someone else. And so when you um, lock the personal Yes, that's our standard operating procedure. And at any time, do the patients get their personal effects back? Uh, once they're discharged. Um, so when they leave the board? Yes, ma'am. And so what does that actually entail? What is your actual procedure that you have on your unit with regard to persons or patients' personal property? Uh, once during the admission process, um, the technician or nurse um, will go ahead, most of the time it's technician, will go through all the patient's belongings, one by one, piece by piece, every single credit card, debit card, everything in their wallet, pants, shirts, pockets, shoes, socks, and we document everything that is in those, one by one. And again, do you do this for every single patient that comes to Yes, ma'am. And so on March the 2nd of 2018, did you have an opportunity Yes, ma'am. And so, with regard to the inventory and search of personal items, um, did you and your team do that for who's going to go? Yes, ma'am. So we're looking at State's Exhibit 19, which I'll tell you are the medical records, and they're admitted. And I'm going to, there's a lot of different sections with a lot of different pages, but I'm referring to the 41 page, the 41 page section, specifically page four of 41. I think we could take that binder off. Okay. Actually, we'll look at, let's look at page three and four with it for the judge. Yeah, three and four. First, looking at page three, um, kind of explain to the judge what is documented on page three. Uh, this is our treatment procedures, um, what we do at admission, what we teach the patient, um, what we tell them about the unit, um, if they verbalized, if they understood what we said. Okay, and so did you do that for Mr. McDonald? Yes. And then with regard to page four, um, explain to the judge what's um, listed out on page four. This is the initial body search checklist. And this is conducted by two of the same sex um, nurse and technician. They do a full body search of a patient to document any tattoos, scars, cuts, bruises, anything like that. They have the patient change, complete the disrobe, and disrobe into a new set of um, garments. Why do you do that? Uh, in case they, the person has anything on them. Um, also, like I said, to document any wounds. That way, if they leave with wounds, we know kind of where they came from or if they were already there to begin with. They could have something on them that they could harm themselves or someone else with. And so did you do this uh, body check for someone Or I guess someone in your team did? Yes, yes. And do you remember who on your team did that check? Yes. Who was 
uh, Brandon Lucas, who is an RN, and um, Senior Airman Jared Manning, who's a mental health technician. And then going down to uh, item number 12, um, you listed some of the Um, no, we did not. What about, wait, do you see number 12, search access clothing? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, in the body search. I apologize. Yes, while he's in the room, they do that. Correct. And then inventory all items for the protocols and guidelines. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And is that listed out anywhere in the medical records? Yes, ma'am. It's uh, we have a um, a form that we fill everything out. Yes, uh, the form has a certain amount of things that are pretty common, shirt, socks, shoes, and so it's annotated next to it, how many shirts, how many socks, how many shoes, things like that, and then below that there's just a free type of other things that are listed. We'll list every single credit card, every single debit card, immunization card, anything that's in their wallet, um, every minuscule little thing. Yes, ma'am. And what was that? Um, there was a handwritten note that was in his pants. It's like a grocery list of some things to buy. And so um, what did you do with that, with that note when you found it? Um, I was alerted immediately once it was found. Um, once I saw it, I went ahead and I put a patient label sticker on it, and I scanned it in the system and let the doctor know. And why did you do that? I had standard operating procedures. Any point in time, have you had any conversations with the OSI officers with regard to Mr. McDonald's? No, ma'am. Have you had any conversations with any law enforcement officers from the Air County Sheriff's Office? No, ma'am. My colleague is asking me to say, what is an OSI officer? Oh, you know, I don't recall what it stands for. <laughs> They're like the police or the investigators of the military, I believe. <laughs> the military. Yes, yes. So you didn't talk to anybody from the military? No, ma'am. You didn't talk to anybody from the civilian police? No, ma'am. Was um, anybody from either the military police or the civilian police a part of the body search and the individual search of the body? No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, and I guess, I think you already kind of explained it, but do you know, do you remember, do you have information as to the concerns or the command as to why they were directing this way? Um, from my understanding, from the emergency room, um, as well as the doctor, because that's how we get our information, um, he went to go purchase a gun, and they were concerned for safety purposes. And so this, what started off as a Any 
Um, as far as I guess the, the medical hold with regard to him. It, meaning, did he become voluntary? Is that what you mean? Yeah, or, yeah did, did his status change? No, it, as far as I understand, the whole time he was there, it was under an involuntary boxer. Okay, that's what I was going to have to explain. So what is a boxer? A boxer is uh, a military member who comes to our unit who either doesn't want to be there and is refusing to sign in voluntarily, or if the doctor automatically assumes, you know, I, I'm not even going to offer the voluntary, you know, you need to be here um, involuntary, I guess you want to say. <laughs> so uh, basically, who on the board makes the determination that a boxer or an involuntary hold um, is in place? A psychiatrist. So the doctor makes that? Yes, ma'am. And did the doctor do that in the McDonald's case? Yes, ma'am. Emergency room was Dr. Mollick. And was he evaluated later, even after the boxer was put in place? Yes, ma'am. Um, usually on the day shift, um, the attending doctor usually will see the patient. Do you know who the attending doctor was? Uh, Dr. Teresa Williams. And so when the doctor is evaluating the patients with regard to the boxer, um, what does their evaluation entail? Um, I'm not. I only work mostly day or night shift, um, but for the most part, they get like a history and physical. A lot of times, they ask a lot of the same questions, maybe that the psychiatrist in the ER ask them. Um, maybe go a little more in depth with things, um, stuff like that. And again, these are the sports that the psychiatrist and all the patients that come through. Yes, yes, they see a doctor every single day. Just because a command directs a patient to the ER, they are not the deciding factor of the person being admitted and being held. The command is just recommending it. But in terms of how that, that plays out in the timeline, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the person who starts the process is the commanding officer, right? Yes, sir. And then the person is taken to a psychiatric facility. To the emergency right? room. Right. To the emergency room first. And, and that is not voluntary for the, for the service. For the, can you say that again? Sorry. The, the service member, the soldier, the airman, the, the person being directed to attend this psychiatric evaluation, the person who's the subject of the CDE, mm -hmm. they don't get a choice of whether they go to the emergency room or not. If the commander has initiated the CDE process, right? Yes, because the commander is recommending it. Or yes. So if, if the if patient slash airman said, "I don't want to be here. I'm checking myself out against medical advice," that, that doesn't. Those magic words don't get them out of the ER, correct? As far as the ER, I, can't, I mean, I can't tell you the procedures of the ER, so I don't know. If, if somebody is taken to you, brought to you, Unless, under a CDE, mm -hmm. and they said, I don't want to be here, let me go, you would have to tell them you can't leave. On the psych unit? Correct. Yes, correct. Okay. And that, that's what, to be clear, Mr. McDonald was brought to you under this uh, procedures, right? Yes, yes, sir. So his transport, he had no say in whether he got transported to your unit, correct? Correct. And he had no say once he got there, he had to go to this evaluation. Correct. Right. Uh, so when he gets there, how long is that period where he, he's not free to leave? 
it can vary. There's no set timeline. But, but the triggering mechanism is basically a psychiatrist has to see him and evaluate him. Yes, sir. Pursuant to that directive from the committee. Yes, sir. Until that happens, he can't leave. Yes, sir. And so in that sense, he's kind of like a prisoner in a certain sense. Is that fair? I, I wouldn't. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I mean, I... Well, you're, you're taking his clothes, right? Or someone at the hospital staff is taking his clothes. In the emergency room or the psych unit? In the psych unit. Yes. And you're taking his belongings, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And his commanding officer is instructed that he has to do this, right? Yes. And y'all are under directive not to let him go until it's completed, right? Correct. And how long it may take is variable and not in his control. Correct. It depends on when the doctor gets around to coming. I mean, the doctor usually comes. It's not a when the doctor gets around to come to him. I mean, the doctors usually come within a couple hours. Okay. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying, well, let, well, let's just say, until the doctor comes, he can't leave, right? Correct. And then once the doctor comes, if the doctor you know, verifies with the commanding officer's initial good faith reason for initiating the CD protocol was valid, then he still can't leave, right? If they uphold the boxer, yes. And he, he, what, what is his recourse in that situation? What can he do to get out of this hole once a psychiatrist agrees with his commanding officer? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. You don't see that very often? No, no. Most of the time, if the psychiatrist agrees with the commanding officer, the person's not going anywhere, right? Correct. Okay. And you would have no reason to expect any different in this case? Correct. Okay. So, um, just so I'm clear, that you, you, went, you went through several things. You talked about the 41 series within these medical records that are states 19. Do you recall that? The 41 pages? Yes. Yes. And are you the author of all 41 of those pages? No, sir. Okay. Are you the author of any of these pages? Yes, sir. All right. Can you kind of help me better understand what parts of this you personally author? Sure. Let me start with page one. And we're talking about the 41 series, right? Yes, 1 through 41. Starting with um, BH patient luggage inventory. Okay. Is that where you're looking? Yes. Okay, yes. So um, you, you authored that, right? No, I did not author this. Okay. Now, and to be fair, most of this is what we're looking at on 1 of 41 is a generic, like, kind of a form, right? Yes. So, like, Mr. McDonald didn't have a field jacket or a canteen on or anything like that? No. So the fact that those items are listed in this section of the entry doesn't mean anything. The bottom, under civilian items, on the left, it says count. So when there's a number under any of those, that's what he came with. Okay, so we, I see that. We have one shirt, one shorts, one pants, one shoe, one belt, etc. Mm-hmm. Th those are things he had on. Yes, sir. One pair of socks. Correct? Yes. And then we, we, it, it continues on to the next page. Yes. And that's where we see car keys, wallet, uh, CAC, what's that? Their CAC card, military um, issued card. Okay. Uh, some, some credit cards, some gift cards, some cash. See that? Mm -hmm. And there's quote unquote paper note. Mm -hmm. That's the note that the state's been asking you about? Yes, sir. And there's no greater detail of what that note is on, in this entry, right? Correct. Is that, but, but I mean, that's not the point of this part of the entry. You're not supposed to document. Correct. 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 Okay. What else did you offer? Um, the um, patient education under grooming, hygiene, learning objectives, as well as right above that. The treatments and procedures. What page are we on? I'm sorry, three. Page three. At the top. Gotcha. And then um, infection control practices. Okay. Then skipping. Um, my part on page four starts at the very, very bottom. Uh, the behavioral health nurse tech admission. Okay. So you would 
should not have been the one that certified these check boxes on page four regarding the initial body search checklist. No, sir. All right, somebody else entered to pay these entries, right? Yes. Do you know who that was? Um, that was the nurse, Brandon Lucas. Nurse Lucas? Mm hmm. As well as uh, Airman Manning. Airman who? Manning. Manning. They were both the ones who were in the body search. So they would have been the ones to actually have found the paper note on his person? That was found in his belongings that we took when he came up on the unit. The belongings come up with him while he's being wheeled in a wheelchair. We bring the belongings behind the desk, and then he goes into the body search room with the nurse and the technician and gets the body search done. I see. So it wasn't found on his body. Correct. It was found after the room was closed and stripped of the camera. Correct. Okay. So the clothes go one way, he goes the other, and then y'all want to the clothes and you Yes, sir. And you were the one that actually found them? No, I wasn't the one who found the note itself. My technician found it. Mr. Lucas? No, no, Mr. Manning. Mr. Aaron Mr. Manning. Okay. Did he call it to your attention immediately? Yes. Okay. Now, you indicated that you had not been made aware of the developments that were going on in the outside world about Mr. No, we, I, knew, I knew a little bit of what was going on because I have to get the information from the psychiatrist as well as the ER gives me information. So it's a collateral effect of information we get. We get both from the patient as well as doctors, nurses, things like that. And they would have known that the sheriff's office was investigated, he had been arrested previously. And they would have known those things. Yes. And that information was related to you? Yes. So you, you were aware that he had been um, I believe he told me, Mr. McDonald did at the time. I didn't know that aspect. Um, he was telling me he was having pain in certain parts of his body. Okay. He, he was complaining of injury from the arrest? Yes. Okay. What specifically? Just pain. Um, I would have to look back at my notes specifically. I don't recall exactly where the pain was. It could be. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to call your attention to page 11. There's a president who's past psychiatric history. That's 11 of 41. Yes, sir. And did you offer any of that? Yes, I did. Okay. And so you conducted that interview? Yes, yes, sir. Is that interview uh, sort of short and sweet, whether it's why you're here, or is it supposed to be pretty in depth? Kind of in between. We don't really go into huge depth. Um, we ask the questions that are pre filled out, and if there is some elaboration needed, depending, we will do that. So the purpose of these records is so that does come to do his evaluation. He'll read this first and familiarize himself with what you already have put in before he ever speaks to Mr. McDonald. Yes, sir. Okay. And the indication here is that he's telling you he feels fine. Right? Ye yes. I feel okay about myself right now. Right? Yes. I said, yes. The question was, how do you feel about yourself? And, um, you know, he gives you some background about his family, uh, background about his family, psychology, things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he tells you that he, he believes the reason he's here is because he had the idea to purchase a gun. Correct. Now, there are some indications in this report that detail that more specifically. Like, did you know that he had not successfully purchased a gun? I did not know that. But there was no gun in the inventory you no, sir. Um, I just, I understand this question, but I just want to say there's just a misrepresentation of all the facts with regard to what Mr. McDonald actually purchased. They purchased a gun and left it on the counter or left before they, okay. I know. Uh, if, Your Honor, we're going to have that discussion.
discrepancy, that's fine, but I'd ask the state, let's be clear, the arrest in this case is also without a warrant. And this entirety of this examination is sort of put the cart before the horse because the boxer authorization only occurred after Mr. McDonald had been held without cause and without a warrant for <coughs> many hours in the Bear County Jail or the County Sheriff's Office. And so if we're talking about the, the ping pong ball of burden here, the obligation to prove that that is legitimate, up to and including all of this, is their burden. And we've not heard any evidence or testimony yet about what happened in Nagels, whether the gun was purchased, whether it was yeah, purchased. Yeah, we're We're happy to introduce the receipt for Nagels and some of that, Your Honor. Okay. But our contention is, is that he was in Bear County custody, but by the time he gets to the service, then he's no longer under arrest in Bear County. Uh, and, 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 okay. Be that as it may, the state will stipulate it, but they have to. That Mr. McDonald's detention by law enforcement, up through and including his detention at, at Sanxi or Vanson, is warrantless. And I, I think we, we know where that burden lies, and we can talk about whether there's a misrepresentation of the record or not. I think they're just getting at a factual that we did. If they have the receipt or whatnot, he really purchased it and walked out, or he just never purchased it, just walked in the store, but uh, just uh, um, compare that up with a receipt or something like that. But go ahead. Thank you. So you, you don't know whether he bought a gun and didn't buy a gun? No, yeah. no, I don't. And but, but you do know that you didn't see a gun in his inventory? Correct. Uh, and no one told you that there was a gun left behind somewhere else? I No, I don't know anything about that. Uh, do you know that there are materials in these records that indicate Mr. McDonald was purchasing or attempted to purchase four boxes of ammunition? Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. That wasn't part of your discussion? No. What's in the receipt on that uh, that they all are trying to keep out from the hospital? It's not the ammunition, it's a shopping list? But it's ammunition? Or? I think what's going to offer is once Mr. Ferguson is done, we can excerpt from state. There is a state exhibit 18. We can pull that out for your honor and maybe mark those as like 18A, 18B, so you can reference those. So what, what is in the shopping list that was recovered? It's not the, it, it, it's not the Lowe's receipt, it's not the Nagel's receipt, it's something it's else? It's related to the Lowe's receipt, Your Honor. And, and part of the issue here is that, the, I mean, we, we, we're, we're trying to, I'm trying to compartmentalize this as best I can through discrete events through time, but there's bleed over. And because some of these events occur without warrant, and some occur with warrants, and each warrant has its own factual misrepresentations to deal with, gets a little bundled, but the long and short of it is, contemporaneous with Mr. McDonald's apprehension in Nagels or within... We were trying to say why the officers were able to get into, you know, I guess, control of the receipts from the hospital, and and, uh, and those receipts do include whatever you buy at Lowe's, uh, right, a right. shovel, catch it, something like that. So the, the receipt is found pursuant to either a warrantless search of Salty Cove on the second, or a warrant-based search of Salty Cove on the second, predicated on a warrantless search on the second because it's all too good. And I'm asking you, is the receipt found at the hospital on him, on him or is it in the house? The receipt is found in the house. The house right. okay. I think, okay, go right, clarify. The, I thought this one of your memos no, said something about shopping list was found with the, the, it is. You know, correct. The, the shopping list is the subject of what this witness is here to test. Yes, for. what was in that list is what I'm asking. The well, shopping list, let me get over I didn't yeah. ask the witness that question. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, so did you personally lay eyes on the list? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, what was that? Did you lay eyes on the list yourself? Yes, sir. After Airman Manning found it? Yes, sir. Uh, do you know how long after Airman Manning found it you called it to your attention? Immediately. Okay. You would have been around the same area of the hospital? Correct, sir. Okay. And do you know what that list contained? Um, I can, off the top of my head, there was, uh, I believe, a shovel. Um, I know at the very end, what was very distinct was it said after Lowe's or after purchasing that, uh, fill up gas cans. Um, I believe there was an axe. I can't remember exactly, but I can look at the list. Okay, but it was, it was a matter of variety of gardening implements or things like that. I, I guess. Um, and it's a shopping list that he wrote down or somebody wrote down, not a receipt? Of was, it, was, it, was it typed? Or it was, was a handwritten note. Okay. Did you make any effort to determine whether that handwriting was Mr. McDonald? No, that's not my 
that's not in my <laughs> scope of practice. You didn't, um, obviously, barring expertise, you didn't have a lot of occasion to look at Mr. McDonald's handwriting except perhaps the signature. Correct. The signature may differ from the handwriting. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you found this one. Um, then if you say that standard practice, once you inventory things, is that you lock them away in a safe for safekeeping, correct? Correct. And in this instance, in addition to that, you scanned it into his medical file, correct? correct. That, in part, I gather because you thought it might have significance to his greater mental health picture. Correct. Okay. And you wanted the psychiatrist to see it. Correct. Okay. So, for your purposes and point of view, you collected this note because you thought it was significant. The goal of diagnosing Mr. McDonald or concluding he has been diagnosed. For the reason that he was there. Which was? The, the reason for buying a gun. And I knew that his wife was missing. And so even when a person comes in for suicidal thoughts, if they have a suicide note, we even scan that. Well, let, let's, let's back up. And he didn't know. I didn't know that he had. He didn't have suicidal thoughts. It's just the he went to buy a gun. Okay. So anytime. Yeah, that's all you know is that he went to buy a gun. And that his wife was missing. Okay. Yeah. Now, so the, the, the idea that he had suicidal thoughts was nothing that was ever explicitly said. No. Okay. No, no one. Did, did you see the directive from his commanding officer? No, I didn't. Do you know who his commanding officer is? No. I believe I, I have it written down uh, because we do have to get the commander's information, but I don't recall off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, and, and certainly you never saw any direct evidence in the form of a direct communication from his commanding officer saying anything about him. Direct communication from the commanding officer to? Well, going back to our, our, our rubric for how CDE is executed, mm -hmm. right? It starts with the commanding officer. Mm -hmm. It's it his job in good faith to decide whether or not there is some serious risk of harm to others or to oneself or some other serious psychological disability that would affect active, his ability to actively participate in the military, right? That, that's what he has to decide? Yes. Okay. And once he's made that good faith determination, he has to say or write something to get that process started, doesn't he? They, to my understanding, I don't believe they write anything. They usually just send the patient to the emergency room. Okay, so on his verbal order, someone can be sent up. Correct. Nothing has to be done right. I don't know for sure. I don't know what the ER's protocol is regarding that. Is there ever any concern that there's been a misunderstanding here? The commander never made the order? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. In a psychiatric ward, no one's ever even paranoid state of mind throwing out the possibility that you guys got the wrong idea I'm not supposed to be here? Well, collateral is obtained, not just from the patient themselves, but if there's other battle buddies or other people, family, friends who have knowledge, commanders as well, um, usually the doctor will get collateral information before they decide to admit a patient. Okay, but you didn't collect any collateral? No, that's not my job. Not your job, okay. So at, at this point in the process, you wouldn't have even no. Okay. Who communicated to you that this procedure was even underway? I mean, in other words, I mean, this may be a silly question, but how is it that you understand that this is an involuntary CDE situation and that you're supposed to do this preliminary workup so a psychiatrist can decide whether it's safe or not? I get it once the doctor's already evaluated the patient. I don't. The doctor comes and brings the, the involuntary or voluntary consent form to me, telling me, I just evaluated this patient in the ER, here's the situation. Okay, so you, by the time you did this inventory and everything else, Andre had already spoken to him. Yes. Okay, and did you have the ability to review his notes and the portions of this report that he offered? Um, I don't recall. Okay, well let me call your attention to page 29.
see on that page that there's a fairly long recitation of the, the history and the facts about this case? Yes. Did you have a chance to read that prior to your evaluation? No, I believe this was, hold on, let me see who the author of this one is. I believe this one is the author, I believe the author of this one is Teresa Williams. She comes on after. I've, I've already left at this point. Okay, so this is, this is the... This is the day shift. The medical workout that took place after you had done your intake. Correct. Okay. Right. Can you point me in the direction that the medical workout would have had to the intake Sorry, say that one more time. What, what part of the report from the psychiatrist initial conversation with Andre did you have a chance to read? A lot of times um, we don't get a chance to see the report that the doctor writes by the time the patient comes up because either the doctor is seeing other patients in the emergency room, so the doctor had not written his history and physical by the time he came up to our unit. find the date these are so when they're printed back there we go um 2317 on march 2nd okay that's the day that he was brought in correct that would be relatively shortly after he was brought in right i believe so i would have to look at the exact time he got to our floor so this would not have been written by the well i'm i'm it says stored by Royce A. Mollett, Captain, and then Teresa H. Williams, MD. Yes. So what does stored by mean? That's the person who saved the note. Okay. So Dr. Mollett would have saved it first, and then Dr. Williams, when she comes on, if she adds anything like an addendum or anything to that, she'll then store it as well. So Mollett would be the, would be the initial psychiatric evaluation, and Williams would be the, the, the actual MD follow-up. Yes. It's fair to say, given the time and the fact that this was saved by both treating uh, officials, this is something that would have been generated in the file before you met. No? Not before, no. Okay. So you would not have been able to review any of this? No, sir. Under assessment? Yes, ma'am. So, what's your question? So what's your question? Would you agree that this is a closer case than some of these? I, I couldn't. I don't, that's way out of my spectrum. <laughs> okay. you're, you're not really making any kind of evaluative call? No. Okay. Um, so did you, you personally scan this into the file? Right? The, the note? Yes. Correct. All right. I want to talk to you a little bit about medical files. Okay. Um, in your training, I, 
gather that you have been educated on privacy laws that relates to medical records and things of that nature. Right? Mm -hmm. Sorry for the record. I need to yes, sorry. I know. It's, no. a, it's really nice that we just have this conversation, but it isn't. No problem. Um, and you know, based on that, if I walked into the Tennessee Hospital and I said I want to see you know, John Doe's patient file, please, and I have no proof that I'm John Doe or that I have his medical power of attorney or anything of that nature, you wouldn't give it to me, right? Correct. And that would apply with equal valid figure if I was a civilian or I was a police. I don't know the limitations when it comes to medical records for police and stuff like that. Okay. But, but let me just put you this way. If you were in a position where you were looking at that file, you had it in your hands, whether I'm a policeman or a civilian, and giving you no background information, you wouldn't give it over to you, right? Say that again, sorry? Policeman or non-policeman, someone asks you for someone else's medical file, they don't have a court order, they don't have any proof that they are the patient or the patient's power of attorney, you wouldn't give over someone's private medical information, would you? Correct. You understand enough about privacy law, though, that there has to be some, something extra besides just a regular old request. Correct. Uh, and then it's part of your duties and responsibilities to keep that information. Yes. And, and you also know that under boxer law, while you do have some obligation for, to convey you know, general details about whether someone's fit for duty to the command, that there are even privacy protections within the boxer law about what can be handed over to the command officials, right? I believe so. I'm not. I'm not exactly very well versed in that. Fair to say that. You know enough to know that you would need to ask a supervisor before you would give the file over to someone's commanding officer. Yes. On their referral request. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and to be clear, you did not give over any information about Ray McDonald's medical file to law enforcement in this case, right? No, sir. Do you know who did? No, sir. Okay. Do you know what happened to the physical note? Um, I believe it was put back into his pants pocket. Okay. Do you know what happened to the pants? They, he, honestly, no, I don't, because I wasn't there the next day. Would it surprise you to learn that you told the DA at one point that you don't know what happened with this one? I don't recall, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Should have been. Uh, usually, once the inventory is done, it's presented to the patient. The patient signs the hard copy that's printed from the computer, and then that's placed in the hard copy chart. But to be fair, you're relying on what you know about what should happen. Right, correct, not sir. What you remember specifically this correct. In fact, you told the DA previously that you're not sure if yeah. that happened. Yes, I'm not sure. Okay. So it, it may well not have happened in this case. It's possible. And, some, and sometimes that does happen. Possibly, yes. Do you know where the rest of his belongings in the What do you mean, the rest of them? All the other things that were on that inventory list that were put into safekeeping. They were put into safekeeping. I don't know what happened because I wasn't there the day he left. No, sir. We don't know whether they took the file or whether they just took 
snapshots of the file? No, sir. And you wouldn't know who gave them that permission? No, sir. That's okay. Um, sometimes we take it for granted in San Antonio that everybody knows what BAMC is. <laughs> um, so could you just please make sure the record is clear? Is BAMC a government facility? Yes, ma'am. And specifically, what sort of facility is it? It's a hospital. And specifically, who runs the hospital? The military. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, Brook Army Medical Center. It's also referred to as San Antonio Military Medical Center. Or JDSA Joint Base San Antonio. <laughs> uh, and going back to uh, the fact that you do these sort of inventories on every single patient when they come into your ward and look into the home, I think one of the reasons that you said that you know obviously you were uh, concerned about potential dangers of items that might be in the most home belongings. Um, what are some of the other reasons that you're making sure you're inventorying and listing it, no to be in the record, I mean, no to be in the medical record of the items that were collected. So that uh, we can ensure that whatever they came with, they're leaving with, nothing got lost, nothing, you know, went missing or anything while they were with us. Basically to just protect their property. Correct. Any claims that they might make against the hospital. Correct. Yes, sir. Hello. Brian Ray. What do you do for? Uh, I'm with the San Antonio Police. Okay. Uh, and in what capacity do you work with? Uh, I'm currently a. Yeah. 
ini kita lihat. Homicide detective. Okay, and how long have you worked as a homicide detective? Uh, since 2017. Okay, how long have you been in this office? Since 1988. But not here, but I've been here since 2003. Okay. Uh, now, do you recall the events that transpired on March 1st of 2019? If that's the day that this all started, I remember a phone call. Okay. Uh, do you ever have a conversation with Carol Gambar on that day? Again, if that's a day, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Do you, do you know Andrea McDonald? Yes. And do you recall that she had been missing back in March of 2019? Yes, sir. And do you recall receiving that news first from Carol Gambar? Yes. So would it surprise you that that took place on March 1st, 2019? Not at all. Okay. And when do you recall anything about that telephone call? Excuse me? Do you, do you remember anything about that telephone call? Some. Could you tell us what happened? Uh, I'd received a call from Carol Ganbar, uh, and she indicated that Andrew was missing. And okay. she was inside the house when she called me, and I told her to get out and go pick up her uh, Andrew's mother. Okay. Do you, do you believe that she was still inside of the house when she called you? I believe so, yes. Okay. Did she describe to you seeing things in the bathroom of that house? Yes. In particular, did she describe seeing blood and hair on the wall of that house? Yes. And did you believe that from the nature of the call, she was describing those things to you while uh, she was still present on the premises? Yes. Okay. And your instructions to her were to leave, right? Yes. That's because you understand that don't have a property interest or permission or consent to be on private property uh, or trespassing, right? No. That is not your understanding? That was not, I don't understand your question then. Did, did you give her the advice that she needed to leave in part because what she had just described to you is uh, potentially illegal? Potentially illegal? Yes, sir. No, that was not my intent. Okay. What was your basis for selling her machine? <clears throat> uh, having known Carol and her husband for a while, that's how I met the McDonald's through them. I was told they had a very contentious relationship. And based on what I had seen and then what Carol explained to me, I figured the house was a crime scene and she needed to get out and not disturb anything. So from your point of view, you, you, the description you received from the Scanbar led you to believe that Carol was standing in the middle of a crime scene. That the house was a crime scene, yes. Okay. Uh, and then you instructed her to go and, and get Maureen Smith, right? Yes. Uh, did you know Maureen Smith? Uh, no. Okay. Why did you, did, did you, did you specifically ask her to get Maureen? Carol had explained that Andreen, uh, who was like a creature of habit, was not there. And I can't recall, but I'm pretty sure I knew at the time the house was within county property, not within city of San Antonio property, that she could not report her as messing that she needed to go pick up her mother. because She had mentioned that Andrine had not picked her mother up at one of their assisted living houses. So I said, go pick her up. She can report Andrine is missing, not you, and then go back to the house. Okay, so it was based on that that you thought that the mother needed to be brought back? That, that Carol needed to, if she hadn't already explained to, and explained to her that Andrine was not the house and needed to be brought be reported missing. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of things about that. First of all, um, did 
you understand from Carol that Maureen was not staying at Solitude Cove that day or that previous night? I don't know where Solitude Cove is. I'm sorry. At the McDonald's hub? That she was staying there? Were you aware from your conversation with Carol Gambar whether Maureen was actually staying at the McDonald's residence the night before and that day? Again, I'm sorry. You mean like, did she actually, was she living there, or was she at the just at the house? Well, what did you know about Maureen Smith's living situation? I, I didn't. You knew nothing about it. No. Okay. Um, why did you believe that Maureen Smith would be able to report the missing person when this Gambar lived? Because she was her direct relative as her mother. Okay. Did Carol explain to you the way? Uh, I don't quite. Did she she, she didn't out? mention a time frame. Just that uh, Andreen was supposed to meet her, I believe, and did not show up. Okay. Well, let me ask you this: You've been on site for a long time, right? Yes. If somebody called you and said, "I'm calling from within the city of San Antonio to your jurisdiction. I'm the next in command. My loved one has been missing for one hour." That would not be something that triggered a response from you. Just that statement alone? Correct. No. The, uh, typically, even in today's world, I know the law has changed a little bit on this. <coughs> typically, if a homicide detective isn't really going to be concerned that there's a job to do until someone is missing for a significant number of hours, right? That is incorrect. Okay. If someone's been missing for an hour, I mean, without more, if someone's just missing. It, it depends on the. To, to initiate an investigation. It, it would depend on the circumstances of why they are missing, or why they are believed to be missing, I should say. Okay. But does the length of time involved play no role in your mind? Again, that depends on the situation, sir. Okay. Fair to say. If someone, if you saw someone being abducted, uh, or, or get in a strange car, or you saw someone's happy to play the food, a uh, place where it shouldn't be, and they've been missing for an hour, that might be different than a situation where no one knows one thing or the other about the person and they just haven't been seen for an hour, right? I, I'm sorry, I don't understand your, your question. We'll, we'll, move, we'll move on. You, you uh, instructed Carol to go get Maureen and then call the police. Is that fair? Yes. And when, was it the end of your conversation? Uh, I believe so. Did you have any text messages with her after that? Did she give you an update? Uh, I don't recall. Uh, I did get some information about what was occurring after, but I don't recall who that was from. Can you say that again? I don't. I did get some information uh, after about kind of what was going on. But I don't recall who that was from. But it wouldn't have been from a police source. It would have been private acquaintances. Right. Updating you on this. Right. I, and I believe that so. Yes. I don't. I didn't talk to any police. That would have been uh, on March first. Okay. I, if that's the day it occurred, I think we agreed to that. Yes. It would have been that day. So a moment ago we were going back and forth about under certain circumstances like the time may not matter if you know enough about the situation. What you knew in this situation was that a friend had gone inside of her friend's house, no one was home, and found blood on the bathroom lights. That's what we were told. Yes. Um, and so under those circumstances, you believe that someone have made a report that would have triggered police response based on that information. That was your understanding subjectively. That and, and including what I knew about the relationship between the McDonald's. Okay. That, that's why I told her, get out of the house. Basi I didn't tell her this, but basically it's securing the crime scene. Don't contaminate it. And then go get somebody who can report her as missing. Now, Tampa Bay Police Department and the American Sheriff's Office, it's not like y'all don't talk, right? Correct. You coordinate on investigations. 
Sure. Go, uh, counterparts and colleagues and then on the side of the Bear County Sheriff's Office, right? Sure. Uh, and you were maybe advised of things that gave you concern. You didn't notify anyone about this when the Herald contacted you? No. Did you write a report? No. Did you notify a superior SAPD? I'm sure I did, but not at that time. There was no need. I, I was simply a civilian at that time, not acting in any official capacity whatsoever. Did you explain that to Carol? I don't think so. Okay, you understand Carol, Carol knows you're a detective. Yes, and I would assume that's why she called me. Because you're a homicide detective? Yes. Okay. So, so Carol's calling the homicide detective. You are a civilian in your mind. No, at that time I was not on duty. So I had no reason to call 911. She knew what was going on. Her, Andrean's mother, could provide more information than I could. And I knew Carol was responsible enough to pass that information along to uh, the law enforcement agency that showed up. So. You received the subpoena and uses taken in this case back some time ago. Do you remember that? Yes. And it was in, specifically we were looking for a phone that you would have communicated with Carol about, right? Yes, my personal phone, yes. And um, you have since advised that that phone is no longer in your possession. Correct. Now, when did it cease to be in your possession? I can't be specific, but uh, it dropped out of my pocket. When I was in a parking lot, the screen cracked, no longer usable, I had to get a new phone. That was after you received the subpoena in this case? No, but way before I received the subpoena. Okay. Now you, that was him, yes. Do you remember telling him that you were unwilling to give that information? To give what information? The information that was on your phone. Uh, because I didn't have it and it was broken. Okay. And you told him that you didn't want to do it? Of course not. That, that, you would agree is different. That's an odd thing to say if the reason you can't do it is because the phone was broken. No, it's not odd at all. Why? Why is that? Because it's my phone and it has nothing to do with this case. You're educated on record keeping laws in the state of Texas and what your obligations are to keep records, right? In what manner? Well, you're a homicide detective, right? Yes. And, and the course of that job is important <coughs> that records pertaining to your duties and obligations as a Texas police officer are kept so that they can be reviewed in court. Is that right? Are you relating this to my phone? Aren't you aware of that? I mean, let me ask you this. You understand that if you had information that were to prove someone was innocent of a crime that you previously accused them of. But you have an obligation to turn that over to the district attorney, right? And irrespective of what phone or where, where it's kept, if you were in possession of a document or a video or an audio recording or photograph or anything that would, would prove that someone previously accused of a crime is innocent, you understand that the law in Texas would require you to give that up, right? I'm sorry? Sure. Okay. It wouldn't matter whether it was on your personal cell phone or your work phone or on your digital camera or on you know, your Polaroid album. I think you're complaining what I did was official police I want to hear the response and just ask again. You can answer my question. You, you, you understand that your job is to make sure that the evidence you possess about a case that you work needs to be forwarded to the DA, right? Absolutely. 
And the fact that that evidence may be on a personal phone, or might be on a work phone, or might be on your hard drive at work, or might be on your hard drive at the house, that really doesn't matter, does it? If you have evidence, you're supposed to leave it over, correct? Yeah, I'm a bit confused by what you're asking. If you have evidence, you're supposed to give it over. Sure. And you would not be able to escape reprimand or problems in your job because the document or the thing in question was kept on a personal object versus a work issue object, right? I don't keep anything work-related on a personal phone. That's not my question. My question is, do you understand that you have an obligation to turn over that evidence, right? Sure. Okay. You understand that Carol Gambar is a witness in this case, right? Yes. You spoke with her on the day that she became a witness in this case, right? Yes. You spoke with her about the crime scene when she became a witness in this case, correct? I don't know if I spoke to her about it. Well, did you speak by me? Just like this a moment ago, did you and Carol? No, she advised me that it was, to me, it seemed to be a crime scene. I told her to get out. I didn't discuss anything before or after that. She told you information about what she was visually seeing with her own eyes that day inside the McDonald's house, right? Yes. That's evidence of this crime, correct? And she took photographs of what she saw in the house, right? I don't know about that. She sent those photographs to you, didn't she? No. She texted you about what was going on in this case. She might have texted me, but I received no photos whatsoever. She said she corresponded with what was happening. She wrote things down and told you about it. She typed out things to you. In a text? Yeah. She may have, but I don't recall specifically. Okay, so you understand if you have statements of a witness in a case, those statements need to be turned over to the district attorney, right? I'm not following you with that. Okay. So in your mind, if Ted Bundy wrote out his confession in a text message and texted you on your cell phone, it's in your eyes. Ted Bundy? I'm just trying to get to the heart of it. The witness seems to be a little confused. I want to give him a crystal clear example that won't require any wiggling back and forth. Okay. Can you phrase the question? If a person that you're investigating for a crime writes out their confession in a text message and sends it to your personal cell phone in the middle of the night, so that it's a situation where you may not keep it on your personal cell phone or whatever, but it was sent to that number, it arrived on that phone, you'd have to give it over, wouldn't you, if you're on a gun offense division? Your Honor, may I ask you a question? Thank you. Wouldn't you? I'm sorry, can you repeat what, if it's on my phone? The killer has texted his confession to you on your personal cell phone. Are you going to say it's not my problem because it's on my personal phone and I don't ever have to deal with my personal phone? I'm not going to give that to the district attorney? Is that your testimony? Absolutely not. Your question being hypothetical, nobody would have my personal phone to text a confession to. Okay, so the issue there is that you decide what is evidence or what isn't. Absolutely not. Okay. You agree, Carol Gambar is a witness in this case, right? Carol what? Carol Gambar is a witness in this case, right? Yes. And she corresponded with you in telephonic and text communication on the day she discovered blood in the McDonald house, right? Again, I'm not sure about the texting. She very well may have, but I do not recall that specifically. But she certainly called me, yes. What would show that? I'm sorry? How would you tell one way or the other? I told, was it D.A. Speer, that you guys are more than welcome to obtain my phone records from T-Mobile or Verizon, whoever I had at the time. But my phone was broken and no longer in my possession, so I could not give it to you. Is that broken? When was that at? When you asked for the phone and it was broken? The judge believes the defense subpoena is Mr. Ray's phone as well as several other witnesses' phone. That on the setting on February 16, 2020, it was around that time of the day of the law. And then how far after that? And then it was later on that the court quashed those subpoenas. I don't recall how far after that it was broken. Oh, in terms of when it was broken, I don't recall, Judge. I mean, I see what the defense is saying. I mean, you're a detective, you're a homicide detective, and you can't just, well, I'm on my personal phone and this is 
that you're in a murder investigation, I want to turn some stuff over. But if he's saying he didn't have the information anymore, he didn't have it, they asked for it. Um, you are a no, I that. But um, he's now testifying this stuff was destroyed or it's just gone, right? Yes, sir. That's my understanding that the, the witness has said that the, the phone had been destroyed. I, I know that at least from Detective Bray as well as from several other witnesses, obviously there's apprehension in terms of this going into a private citizen's phone and this, well, in essence, going on a fishing expedition. Yeah, no, I understand that going into the whole phone. I thought y'all turned over a certain amount to just that time period when we had that hearing. This state did speak to Carol Bannemar. I believe that this was brought up when she came up as a witness. Mm -hmm. And she did get to me at the recipient's. Seven, seven screenshots of communications between her and Detective Gray uh, okay. that I did provide to the defense uh, shortly thereafter. But sometime in February 2020, I don't remember the exact day. Now, I believe what they had asked if there was any messages specifically on March 1st of 2019 on messages that I received from Van Bar in terms of their communication. Those messages, I believe, the first one began on March 2nd and then had some subsequent ones all the way, I believe, until December of that year. Oh. Okay. The problem is this, this involves my actions with the court early on in this case. Oh. It's at the chicken and we subpoenaed it. We asked the district attorney's office to take the phone. We provided the court with a state statute that says if you use your personal phone for government business, you go to government phone. The court, based on the representations of the district attorney's office, <coughs> There's a record, strong record in this case of family courts out of concern that we need to get this information before anything happens to it. Before it's not available. Then when prosecutor Spears is talking about, well, I met with Carol and I, I met with uh, Detective Gray and I got 14 screenshots. That later on was kind of made, my recollection is, kind of part of the discussion. And we explained to the court how would we know that's all. And I recall that. Anything else? Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to offer uh, defense uh, 35, which is an email correspondence between Mr. Spear and Mr. Connery about uh, this conversation and the question of this matter. I'd like to show you what we've marked as Defense 35, and I call your attention to the highlighted portions. If you could just read that to yourself and let me know when you're finished. To, you just want me to read the highlighted part? I mean, you, Is that what you said? To, yes, but, okay. yes. The highlighted part specifically about it. Okay. Just those two pages? Yes, sir. Okay. There's nothing in this correspondence with Mr. Spear that indicates that you lost your phone, dropped your phone, and damaged your phone, anything like that, right? Not what I read in that, no. 
What he's communicating is that you don't want to give it over, right? Who? What Mr. Spears communicating to Mr. Comrie is that you're unwilling to provide this material, correct? I, I don't understand. Cause what I just read in the highlighted section doesn't indicate anything like that. Okay, well, you, you agree that the highlighted section is talking about your conversations with Carol Gambaugh, right? Yes. And you would agree that this conversation is indicating that they're not going to get over the phone because you haven't produced it, right? I don't get that at all out of that highlighted section you had me read. That's fine. Shortly after the other one broke, because I couldn't use it. Is that the phone you have now? The what phone? The, the phone I currently use, my personal phone. Is, is the personal phone you use now the same phone that you were using as soon as you replaced the one that broke? Yes, I believe so. In about two years, yeah. So if someone were to get your phone records, we would know the exact day or thereabouts within a couple of days that your phone broke. Okay. As I told Mr. Spear, you guys are more than welcome to obtain my records. I have That's no problem. Question. My, question is, my, my answer is that I've already offered that. Time. Just got a court my, my, my question to you is, if we were to obtain your phone records and we were to look and see the first time you made a call on your new telephone, would that date, whatever date it is, be reflected within a day or two of the time period in which the phone that you were communicating with Carol Gambar on, in this case, was damaged or destroyed? Probably a couple days, because I did try to keep working with it, but the screen just would not work. It's in, I think I, I think I have Verizon, so it's like an LG. Okay. Yeah. Do you have your phone with you right now? Absolutely not. You're on right now. This is getting outside the scope. You're back to the scope. We need to figure out this information one way or the other here. Liz is not going to cooperate with Move on, people with scope. Did you upload any of the data that you? No, I, I'm not very technological, so I just used my phone brand new, and the old one was gone. You, you lost all your contacts. Well, no, I think like when you get a new phone, they update your all those. But yeah, I lost some. I mean, I lost some data on my new phone, I'm sure. But you know, I just the okay, type of guy, just all right, new phone, make do. So it's an Android device. Yes. You got a Google account associated. Alright, move on. That's what Detective. You've been friends with uh, Carol Gambar and her. Yes. And uh, that's how you do a parent for your husband, correct? Uh, actually, uh, part of the senior living services, that's how we met, yes. Well, I was you have been friends for several years. Yes. Now, when she called you, uh, on, I know you didn't know the exact date, but March 1st, 2019, is when this came about. You, you were obviously were not present with her, correct? Yes. And so you didn't know exactly where she was necessarily, correct? Not physically, no, but she mentioned being at Andrean's house. And then she described to you what she saw at this house, correct? Yes. And is that when you gave her the instruction that, you need to, that she needs to get her mother in order to report uh, Andre missing? Yes. Now, you said that you were aware of the, uh, the American strife between Andre and Andre McDonald. Yes. That they had uh, the problems, even problems that, that rose to the, uh, you know, Physically yes, sir. And that coupled with the fact that she didn't go to work, didn't go to the workout, and that Carol Gambar had seen blood in the house, these were all things that uh, led to your calculus in terms of having a reason to report on Dream Missing. Yes. And did you know that Marine Smith was on Dream's mother? Uh, I didn't know her by name. 
So was it something that you said that perhaps somebody had family members such as her mother could report? I, I believe Carol had mentioned that Andrine had not picked her mother up at one of the houses that I guess her mom was working for her at. That's why I told her to go pick her mother up so that the mother could report her as missing. And, and, and you said that this, uh, this time that this phone call came to you, you were not on duty? Correct. You were not acting uh, in your capacity as a detective at the Senate General Police Department? Correct. And part of that defense asked you if you did any type of report or follow investigation. You would not have done so because this was on your case, correct? Absolutely correct. Did you trust Carol that she would uh, make a phone call to the police or at least somebody within her group? Yes. That they would make any type of report as to uh, the disappearance of on train? Yes. And, and of course, later on you learned that that was true, correct? Yes. Now, that, uh, on March 1st, <coughs> that day, uh, you said that you know that you had a phone conversation uh, with Carol Gambar, but you weren't sure if there was actually any text communication on that day. Is that fair? Yes. So, but of course, you had communicated later, of course, those, those texts that we had discussed between Carol and yourself, that Carol had actually turned over those. So is it, would you agree with me that you may have communicated with her later by text? Sure. And just about uh, sometimes just uh, <coughs> some updates about maybe what had been going on with the investigation, what someone may have heard on the news, and then ultimately, I believe, even the, the funeral thing for Andre. Yes. It's been a while. I, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, we were good friends with her, my, my ex-wife and I, and when I got divorced, I really don't talk to them anymore. Okay. Uh, you didn't know Andre and Henry well, did you? No. Uh, and, and you ever met Andre? Yes. And you met Andre? Yes. But on a few occasions, correct? A few, yes, sir. I mean, I, I don't understand. When I, you, you never saw Andre McDonald do anything physical? No. McDonald, right? Correct. And uh, Andre McDonald never talked to you about things that had happened between them? Correct. And Andre McDonald never told you about things that happened between them, did he? No, sir. So what you know about their relationship, we heard from gossip in their hand. Second hand, yes, sir. Sure. I wouldn't know anything about that, no. Wouldn't know anything about it. But that's, you, your position was that, that Carol had told you that uh, Maureen was, was without Ryan and had to pick that up. I guess kind of that uh, Andrine had not picked her up is what she said. Okay. So she left you with that impression? Yes. All right, thank you, sir.
next week we call that the token. Sean Tobelman. I'm a sergeant with Bear County Sheriff's Office Investigations Division. Okay. How long have you been working with the CSO? Uh, about 27 years. Okay. All that time in investigations division, you patrol? No, I, I, I worked a couple of years in the jail, a few years on patrol. 16 total, 16 so years in the investigations. Not an investigative work. What, were you familiar with that case? I am. Did you work on that case? I was a supervisor on that case. Okay. What does it mean to be a supervisor? I oversee certain aspects. Do you, did that mean you call the shots? You have the decision making authority? No, more coordination. Okay. So if someone tells you what they want done and you get the guys to go and carry it out? Correct. Okay. Uh, in particular, on March 1st of 2019, did you have any involvement in the Andrew McDonald case? There were numerous days. Can I ask you to be specific about what on that day or what day that was? Okay. Well, uh, March 1st, 2019, did you, did, did you go out to the scene of uh, missing persons case involving um, Andrew McDonald? <laughs> And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I, I'm not sure what date March 1st is. Is that the first day of the case? Is it? There were numerous days in that case. I understand. Let's just talk about what was your first day on the case? Being in investigations as a supervisor, I heard about things from day one, but I wasn't involved in things immediately. I believe I helped coordinate the night of the original case and some personnel movements. Because I was already out in town on a different case supervising, assisting, coordinating on a different case. Okay. So that night, uh, personnel units, were you talking about surveillance? No. So you no. weren't units to surveil anyone or suspect or anything else? No, now I know more what you're talking about. Um, that would have been shortly after that night. Uh, at that time, I supervised a plainclothes covert unit. Uh, they did a lot of surveillance, and we were called in. Don't remember the exact date. It was a Saturday, I believe, uh, to do surveillance. Could it have been March 2nd, 2019? It, it could have been. But that was a Saturday in early March when this case was undergoing that would surprise you about no, it would not. Okay. And so when we talk about surveillance, were you trying to coordinate surveillance of a person or of a resident? It started at the residence, but it was of a person. Okay. Started at the residence, but it was of a person. So did you make it out to a residence on Solitude Cove? 
No, I did not. Okay. You, you weren't actually at that residence? No, I was not. Uh, at some point, I made it out there, but that day where we started surveillance, I did not. Okay. Are, are you sure of that? If it's the day I'm, I'm remembering, yes, I'm positive. I did not make that location that day. Okay. okay. Let's just focus on the, the, so the human being surveillance that we did that. Okay. Did it start on Solitude Coast Road? The mind memory serves me correctly. If my memory serves, my unit was called in because they wanted surveillance on a person that was at that location. By the time we were called in and moving, he had already left the location. Okay. Did anyone know where he was at that time, or were you just kind of be on the lookout? Uh, if, if memory serves correctly, there was monitoring, GPS monitoring on him, so we knew where he was. No, I don't believe he had a cell phone at that time. Okay. Was it beeper put on his car? Uh, no, I believe it, it was monitoring by the Air Force. Okay. You believe the Air Force was monitoring? Well, it, and so this was an extensive case, and there were different times in the case, and I can have some details confused. No one from my team. My team joined in. Okay. And who did you join? Uh, there was someone on duty that already had surveillance. And that individual was BCSO or Air Force OSI? BCSO. Okay. So someone had a visual on you from BCSO? Correct. It was not you? Correct. But you understand from information after the pawn and relied upon that individual who got their visual of the suspect based on GPS data from Air Force OSI? I'm not saying that for sure. I, I'd have to review every report to remember when that happened. And my, look, I supervised numerous cases. And at that time running that unit, we did lots of surveillance. I could be mistaking him for another subject. Did you meet with the Bear County District Attorney's Office in anticipation of testimony in this case? Yes. When? Uh, a couple weeks ago. I reviewed my report. You reviewed your report? Okay. Uh, did you review any else? Uh, I, I, I reviewed the arresting officer's report from the day that I supervised the arrest. Okay. Your Honor, pursuant to gas, and I'd ask that the state produce uh, uh, Deputy Tobin's report, I believe we have it, but I have from Deputy Tobin of this series of uh, notes. That would sound like normal procedure. Okay, you could delay and provide uh, benefit of the difference between an EOS report and whatever the other one was. Sorry, I didn't do Certainly, EOS is an end of shift, um, and I would just let command know hey, I supervised my investigators' actions on whatever we were taking place that day, and nothing occurred. No worthy. Okay. Or obviously, if something happened, I would report that. But it, my report would be a three line report that says I supervised the investigators in my unit and the actions they took.
saying that he has to provide for them. It's fine. I'm not familiar. Okay.
you indicated that you had reviewed some reports of the administration of the testimony, correct? Yes, sir. And you also seem to indicate that a lot of this is blurring together for you because there were a lot of facets to it and your memory of specific dates is a little fuzzy. Absolutely. But it refresh your recollection to look at your preliminary report that you submitted uh, to uh, Investigator Lugo regarding the events of March 2nd, 2019. Certainly. Show you what I've marked for identification as Defense 36. Uh, you can feel free to refer to that report if you don't recall any of my questions. Uh, give it a chance to review it. And then Just to clarify, this is not my report. This is Investigator Lugo's report to me. Okay. So the fact that it's Tobelman Sean at the top. I'm sorry. I see. This was emailed to you. Correct. I got you. Okay. Does it does it refresh your recollection of those events? Uh, I, I hadn't even read it yet. Just wanted to make Give sure we're on the same page. Supervisor on it. Okay. Does that mean that you weren't at any of the scenes pertinent that day? I, I wasn't uh, involved in the actual surveillance until we arrived at Nagel's gun shop. Okay. You arrived at Nagel's gun shop because you were told the past three months. Correct. Okay. Did you make the decision to have him arrested? I was advised that if he was purchasing a gun, for the safety of all, we were going to take him into custody. Who, who advised you? Command. Who's command? Um, a series of people that I'm giving instructions to by radio. Sheriff Salazar said this? No, it wouldn't have been him directly. But it would have probably come. Is that what you mean by command? No. So command, it, it's a structure, like in any organization. Uh, the head of this investigation, supervisory-wise, would have been Sergeant Mahon from Homicide. He and I would have been the ones communicating. He would have been communicating with his lieutenant. Um, I don't remember at that time if we had a captain in the division and on up and on up. Okay. So who would be the person that you would ordinarily communicate with the command is giving you the direct? Sergeant Mahon. Okay. So Sergeant Mahon, in this case, is the one that told you to, to make this arrest and try to bring us about. Correct. Okay. Were you, did you go into the store and see him? I did. You did? Okay. Uh, and, but he wasn't apprehended at the, inside the Naval Gun Store, was he? No, he was apprehended four or five steps outside the door. Okay. He didn't have a gun in his hand? No, he did not. Okay. Uh, he didn't have any ammunition? No, he did not. Okay. You're of the belief, I gather, by the expression of your face, that the reason for that is that he had made someone in your team and then he had aborted trying to purchase it. He didn't abort, he made a purchase. He, he, he doesn't have a gun, right? He didn't have it in his hands, no. Okay. He walked out without a gun? Yes. Okay. Customer, when you purchase something, you take it with you, right? Normally. That didn't happen in this case? No. None that I'm aware of. He's not under indictment or information for any kind of criminal offense, right? Correct. Objection to speculation on the basis of this. Okay. 
So in your observations, you also observed he was purchasing ammunition, right? Yes. He wasn't buying just one box of ammunition, correct? He bought several, tried to buy or did buy several boxes of ammunition. Uh, I believe it was two boxes, but I'm not positive on the number. More than one. Right. So more than one bullet. Correct. I mean, you probably buy what, 25, 50 rounds per box. Right. So 100 rounds at least. Uh, I, I, it was 25 at least. Okay. Uh, so there's nothing about the purchase itself. Well, I guess let me ask you this. Why was it of such great concern? Why was that the point of no return? That you had to arrest him if he was buying a gun. Um, do, you, do you have any insights? Do you want my opinion? No. I mean, was it, was, did command express theirs? No. Okay. And they didn't they, they tell you one way or the other? No. You were just following the orders? Correct. And the orders were, if he does this, you do that? Correct. Okay. You didn't have a warrant to arrest him, correct? No. Nope. You uh, did not see him commit an offense within your presence in view? No. Nope. You did not see him at the scene of a crime? No. Nope. He was not the victim of any crime? Not to my knowledge. Sergeant John Mahon. Okay. Who does Mahon answer? Uh, he's the homicide sergeant, so he would have answered to the homicide lieutenant, uh, if we had a captain, the captain of CID, the chief of CID, and on up. You say if we had a captain, that implies you don't have a captain, or did Sometimes in our division we have one, and sometimes we don't. Do you know if you did at this time period? I, as I said, I don't remember specifically if we had a captain at that period. Okay. Did you have any I did not. Okay. Were you aware of others within the command structure having contact with Air Force OSI? At that point, I'm not sure. Okay. At some point, though, yes. At some point, there was. Would that have been during the time period that Andre McDonald was still a free man? I, again, I, I wouldn't know for sure Sergeant sort of Mahon was in charge of that part of the investigation. Okay. Um, I, I had a couple different roles, but that wasn't one of them. So, how, first of all, how many deputies are involved in the surveillance process around the I had a team of four, and there was one other that team involved. Uh, do you have any communication with deputies that are engaged in investigative work around Mr. McDonald's residence on Solitary Coast? No. We're on a separate channel working with surveillance on them. Okay. Were there plans before you set out on the surveillance involving Solitary Coast that you were made aware of? No. No, I did not. So this is a Saturday in Texas at a gun store. Um, it, 
it's very active. There's lots of people coming in and out. Uh, Nagel's is not an open tool pen. It's very tight. Uh, there's center pieces that have either stands or displays of things for sale. And then on every wall, there's counters that have glass displays of guns that you walk up to to sit, talk to the salesman. There's maybe a foot and a half between the glass counter and the center displays of different things for sale. There's two rooms. There's a front room and a back room. It, it, it's very tight to fit. Thank 
not to my recollection at all. Did you have any other involvement in this investigation past that day? Yes. Can you can you detail the next thing that you did this day? I'm also a uh, supervisor over our negotiations team. Our negotiations team uh, takes care of the command vehicle. The command vehicle was utilized numerous times in the case to conduct searches. So I would have overseen that. Did you have nothing to do with, for example, assault to code or any other subsequent arrest of Andre McDonald, any subsequent surveillance of Andre McDonald? If there was more surveillance conducted, it would have been my team that would have conducted it. I would have overseen that. Was your written report to that effect? Someone on the team would have, because again, I'm not always present when they're doing the surveillance. We would 
be entitled to know whether or not the warrant is concealing the previous unlawful searches or unlawful observations. We're entitled to go into all of that once we make our private basis shown. In other words, the four corners only have integrity if there are no materially misleading false statements or omissions. And once we cross that threshold, we don't have to be limited to that. And yes, you are also entitled to simply say, fine, I will, especially in the case of a false statement, you can say, I'm going to examine whether this false statement had been redacted out of the document still provides probable cause. Are you saying that from the third one, I'm saying in page 1623, number nine, state of the clause, defense motion to suppress it, you know, you get your claims here, they're nursing that. If I take out the remaining content, if I believe that the falsehood and it's still insufficient to support the issue of the simple warrant, that helps. It's interesting that we're going to get to that. He's saying that it is well that the plan is entitled to hear you after they just. And we address this directly in our last case. I don't think I can anticipate the fact that I wouldn't take it most of the time. We just put a hand in the tent and fix it. We want to report you thoroughly and engage with the process. It's a busy time. 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 It's
if you work with the same crew and everybody changing over. It's the easier, everybody you know, the same image. Thank you. 